Um, a question for Faith and Jenny. The stats that you mentioned, are they published in any First Languages Australia documents? Because people would like to cite them to increase awareness. Yeah, no, um, we haven't published them yet. We sort of pulled them together for today, but I'll make them available. Okay. Um, and Curtis, a question for you. Is there currently a national Aboriginal interpreting framework or policy? No, there's not. Um one that I'm aware of, I believe that there were um, some work towards one. Um, I'm not sure where that's at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think someone did put up a, a, a link to something, a protocol that was published in 2017, okay. if people want to go to that link. Um, okay. Um, a question, I'm not sure who this is for at the moment. How can we influence policy to integrate language classes into classrooms for those Indigenous language centres that have curriculum-based sessions ready to go? If they have their teachers in place, yeah. Um, it just depends on the state and territory, but certainly um, if you want to get in touch with us, we can help put you in contact with the right people as part of that bigger project that we're doing with the um, Department of Education at the moment. And I guess for, for Faith and Jenny and Justine, how can we ensure that a clear implementation strategy is put in place for the national curriculum? ACARA has always said it's beyond their brief. Yeah. Um, Rob, the writer, knows that if First Languages Australia is working towards this, how will government address implementation and not leave it up to ad hoc responses from language centres, individuals and so on? So that's the aim of the two-year project that is being, it's been um, initiated by the Department of Education and they have First Languages Australia, you know, conducting the, the research towards developing a national strategy and this um, we're taking the same approach as we did with the original Ninteringini report which what gave everyone you know a taste of what's happening around the country so it's bringing all the departments from all the states and territories together which they hadn't done before to see what all their diverse approaches are but what are the best things about any of them um, there'll have to be a lot of innovation because as the ACARA curriculum was being developed in all of those consultations, we kept saying, well, who's going to teach it? And what are the resources going to be? But, you know, unfortunately at the time, the answer was, well, that's not the problem now, you know? <laughs> so, and now we do have the problem. So that's why we now need a coordinated national strategy for the training of the teachers and the providing of the resources. Yeah, it's Jenny here again from a language centre perspective. Um, we're at our own, um, at the local level, we, like I was saying in the presentation, we get swamped with inquiries and, and stuff from schools, but there's no sort of thought given to, to connecting the dots locally with our state government in terms of um, synergies and how it fits with national and state policy, because at a language centre level, the, the calls from schools uh, continuous. Mm -hmm. Come every day. They want us to do stuff in NAIDOC week. They want, to, want us to turn all the tricks in the world. But the problem is we don't have the resources or the funding or the, the funding, the profile in the language centre. All language centres should have capacity to develop resources with the right um, equipment and all those sorts of things. At the moment, we're doing service agreements that we've made up ourselves between schools. And I spoke to this uh, at an education forum about a week ago with the state education department, that there needs to be some synergy between the education department and with that resources in terms of implementation for it to happen at the local level. Because language centres are getting swamped, but we need that extra resources and funding and strategies to be put in place so that everyone understands what their roles are responsibilities are in terms of implementation. Curtis, a couple of questions for you. One is about 
what are the prerequisites for becoming an interpreter in terms of training, qualifications, professional development? They've got to um, have uh, good English skills um, and they've got to be able to speak um, an Aboriginal language, including a Creole um, or a Creole. And <coughs> our staff do a language assessment with them um, in the first instance. And much of that will determine whether um, they're going to uh, uh, be able to provide interpreting services. Uh, if they pass that language assessment, um, then uh, we induct them and provide them a training. And that involves doing things such as uh, observing uh, more experienced interpreters on the job um, and also um, themselves being um, observed uh, providing interpreting uh, to um, service providers and Aboriginal language speakers. So much of it depends on that language assessment um, as to whether or not they're going to um, become interpreters or not, or whether or not we say, well, uh, this person um, does have it, we just need them to go and focus on these areas and come back to us again, and we'll do the language assessment again. So much of it depends on their language skills. Mm -hmm. And following on from that, what are the opportunities for training currently for speakers of Aboriginal languages? Yeah, we provide um, our interpreters with training internally. Um, and then the end result is for us to work with NATI um, to get them trained uh, to, uh, and prepared to sit national certification testing. And hopefully the outcome of that is that we have um, NATI certified interpreters. Um, but in terms of our, uh, I suppose, permanent office-based staff, I think it really comes back to um, leadership and a vision uh, for how you want to um, lead that group of people. And I think that includes things like, um, you know, putting things such as the ability to um, speak a language um, in selection criteria. So people are able to um, move through the different, um, I suppose, ASO levels internally and in the NTG um, and being really focused on ensuring that you are developing um, staff at all times, providing opportunities for them. Um, uh, and developing their confidence. And I think a lot of that just comes down to um, leadership, um, uh, acknowledging that we are the AIS and that providing Aboriginal interpreting services is our core business. And um, I suppose me taking it upon myself to ensure that we are um, developing our interpreters, talking to them all the time to find out where they want to go um, and providing them with opportunities to get there. Mm -hmm. Are any education institutions offering training at this stage that you know of? For example, Bachelor Institute? No, Bachelor used to provide um, uh, training. Uh, they don't do it anymore. And I suppose one of the things for us at any stage, we can't um, assure um, somebody that we're going to have this many students at this given time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really difficult to say, okay, well, we're going to provide you with 15 students um, to do this particular level of interpreting training. Um, so that's a challenge that we have in that area as well. Um, so we provide the training to our interpreters ourselves. And as I said, we develop them before we get them to sit the NARTI certification tests. I'm not aware of any um, educational institutions that provide interpreting service. So I think Bachelor were one previously, and I think, um, and I may be wrong about this, but there was a university somewhere in South Australia that used to. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Curtis.